Okay, let's see. Okay, so yesterday uh, I defined the uh, Martin boundary, and so I would like to give you another way of um, looking at it, maybe. So it will be very quick, but I think it's important. So let me remind you that I look at the set of continuous functions on gamma, which I look with the topology of uniform convergence on compact uh, point uh, topology of pointwise convergence. Okay. And so then we consider the Martin kernels, which were defined as the ratio of the Green function taken at x and y divided by the Green function between e and y. And what we wanted was to, so with, with this uh, assignation, We embed actually uh, the set gamma inside C of gamma. Okay. So then the idea is to take the com the, um, the completion of this uh, space, and actually it is compact, and this will give us the Martin compactification. So the closure. So if you, you denote by this phi like that. The closure of phi of gamma will be exactly uh, phi of gamma union the Martin boundary of gamma. So what I would like to make uh, to emphasize is that here uh, this is the same as the exponential of the log, or maybe of j x of y minus the log of g, sorry, e of y. Okay, and so if I divide on both sides by the green function taken at the mutual element, then here you should recognize the green function up to a sign. So this is the same as the exponential of minus. Uh, let's say, do it like that. Exponential of minus the green function taken at the green metric taking the distance between x and y minus the green distance taken from neutral element to y. And so here you should recognize what Lindu um, has defined yesterday as a Boosman function for the green function. Okay, so this is exponential of minus the Boosman. So my notation will be slightly different, but uh, x to e. Okay. So what I want to say here, what? I don't have to. No, because it's already normalized. We're dividing by E is exactly the normalization here that you need. That's right. And so what you, you see is that with this kind of identification, what we get at once is that the Martin um, boundary of my group turns out to be I cannot hear the infimum of Infi uh, which infimum which means that there is a limit as well Well, then I have to, yes, yeah, so then to go to the boundary, I need to take limits as well goes to infinity. So then we get the Boosman function. Yes. That's what you wanted to say? 
This is an equality if I define this to be that. Okay. <laughs> It's convenient, you see, since you embed. Of course, when you look at whole functions, a priori these are functions which will, won't be, come from your space. But to take the compactification, it's natural to, to extend the notion of Boozman. Here we get a natural co-cycle, and so it is very natural, I think, to, to define it even in the space. Even though what we're interested in is we'll take limits afterwards. Because then we can look at boundary properties inside the compactification. So what I wanted to say here is that the Martin boundary now becomes the Boozman boundary of the group when I look at it with the green metric. So in some sense, it is a, a geometric model if, if one can understand what, how the green metric is looking at. And so the, I would like to give another, um, draw some other similarities with uh, hyperbolic groups and uh, uh, hyperbolic isometries. And for this, I need to talk about uh, quasi-conformal measures and stuff like that on uh, Things. So if x, let's assume that it is a proper delta hyperbolic space, and uh, gamma is a subset, uh, is a subgroup of isometries of x. So you know that gamma also acts at infinity. infinity. Okay, so what you can wonder is how is this action with respect to the to the visual distance? So you fix your favorite base point W. You pick two points x and y. And what you want to understand is the ratio of g of x, the distance from g of x to g of y with respect to the visual distance d sub epsilon I had defined divided by the distance from x of y. Okay? So this amounts to understand uh, minus epsilon, what's the same? Epsilon, the difference of the Gromov product of x and y minus the Gromov product at the image. And I want to understand what's going on when x tends to, when y tends to x. So these are two points at infinity, okay, which I see as the asymptotic rays. So the trick here is to, since g is an isometry in your space, you can replace this by the graph of x y taken at g minus one of w. Okay, so somewhere here you will get g minus one of w, and so what? What are you doing? You're looking at the distance here from w to the geodesic to x, y, and then you're taking off this distance. Okay, and so. As y tends to x, this point will go to, to x, and what you will see is that you will get, the, again, the Boozman, uh, the Boozman function. So, uh, lemma, if you want. Uh, the limit of the distance from jx to jy divided by the distance from x to y as y tends to x it will be the exponential of epsilon the Boozman function from g uh, the Boozman function at the point x taken at w g minus 1 of w okay. 
Okay, so here I'm a little, uh, uh, I'm not very precise because I did not define precisely what was the Boosman function at infinity of a hyperbolic space, neither the Gromov product, but this is essentially some sort of continuous extension, a pseudo, of a quasi continuous extension, I should say. Okay, but the idea is exactly that. So it's not an equality, but up to some universal constant, it will be equivalent to that. So what you can see is that the action of G at infinity is like a conformal map because it stretches the distances by a uniform factor, whatever the distance, the way you are approaching the point X. And so then, so this for me will stand for the derivative at a point X at infinity. Okay? That's how I want to look at it. And so I, I want to say that uh, probability measure uh, rho a probability measure. And uh, radon measure too. Okay. So radon uh, means that it is boil uh, is boil boil probability measure. Uh, on dx is a quasi conformal measure for gamma uh, if for any g in gamma the push forward of rho is equivalent to rho, so it, they have the same measure set. And there exists some alpha such that for any g and gamma, when I look at the radon derivatives of the pullback of the measure now, it is essentially e to the power alpha, the Boosman, so at the point uh, A, this is equivalent to the exponential of epsilon alpha, be, the Boosman function at A between W and G minus 1 of W. Okay. So this means that it behaves, the radon encoding is essentially the derivative at A to the power alpha. Okay, so in Patterson-Sullivan theory, this is called a conformal measure. So here it's called quasi-conformal because I don't have equalities. Right? The constant here it does not depend on G. Dep no. Yeah. It's independent. Yeah. It depends only on delta. I mean. And so the theorem so, uh, Patterson Sullivan and Cornet for the setting I'm using is saying that if gamma is hyperbolic, meaning that it has a geometric action on a hyperbolic space, then there exists a quasi-conformal measure, rho, of dimension Nature, I use, I always put uh, V, where V is the volume growth that you've seen now many times, which is one over R, uh, the limit of one over R log of the number of elements G in a group such that uh, G of W belongs to the ball of WR. Okay. 
and it satisfies the following properties. Uh, so if you look at the measure of a ball at infinity of some radius r, then this is essentially the radius to the power v over epsilon. I should say... Uh, and... Uh, moreover, uh, it is essentially unique. Meaning that if rho prime is another quasi-conformal measure then they are equivalent. Meaning that the ratio is essentially uh, bounded away from zero and from infinity. And uh, the third thing is that uh, rho is ergodic. Meaning that any gamma invariant set has either zero mass or uh, total mass. And actually, rho is uh, equivalent to the Hausdorff measure of dimension v over epsilon. So this is the Hausdorff measure. So if you don't know what is the Hausdorff measure, this is OK, because uh, I won't use it explicitly. So I guess I didn't forget anything about this statement. I know it's not exactly in the order I wanted to say, but... Uh, uh, where is it? Okay. Yes. Okay. So here what is important uh, well, everything is important. Yes. So this means that the dimension of my boundary is exactly V of epsilon, in particular. Okay. And so when I defined the Martin boundary before, I told you that when I was looking at the harmonic measures, uh, I know the, the Radonicodine derivatives, right? So in the context of gamma acting on its Martin boundary, what we showed, what I didn't show actually, what I claim is that The Radon-Nicodine uh, Radon derivative was exactly Ka at G, right? And so this is exactly E to the Boosman function in the green metric taken at the point A between uh, e and uh, G, uh, what is it? G or E? I don't, I forgot. Uh, e to T minus 1. Right? So this is exactly the same formula. Okay. So uh, corollary, if gamma dg is hyperbolic, then the harmonic measure is a conformal measure. Okay. Yes, on the Martin boundary, uh, measure is a conformal measure on the Martin boundary of gamma, which is the same as the Gromov boundary of gamma with respect to the green metric. Okay. So this is just a formal identification. I didn't do anything, right? The only theorem was to prove that 
these spaces were the same. But then I just noticed that I have exactly the same formulation. So now all my probabilistic objects become some geometric objects in some sense, with respect to the green metric. So in this sense, it is very natural. So here, I really, I'm saying nothing. Okay. So well, this is a homeomorphism. Ah, here it is an equality, yes. So it's even better. But actually, uh, yes. Well, actually, I want to ask. The thing is that uh, usually I don't think you put uh, the epsilon here in the definition. <laughs> so I got a little uh, mixed up. That's why. I'm not, uh, No, no, that's fine. Actually, that's, that's correct. So it's a uh, it's dimension V because this is the power that you put in front of the... It's not really the dimension, but yeah. The dimension should be V over epsilon, I guess. Just that this epsilon is a little painful, but I have to take... I, need, I cannot avoid it. Good. So it is some sort of abstract nonsense of that, right? Because uh, how to do anything yet? Because I have no. Okay. So now what I want to study is uh, the green distance on uh, hyperbolic groups and see how, if I can say something about that. So the main theorem, so this is, uh, I would say, on Kona. On Kona. Uh, is to say that uh, if gamma is hyperbolic and the support of mu is finite, so when I mean hyperbolic, I mean always non-elementary and hyperbolic. <laughs> and symmetric. Then the green distance is quasi isometric to a wet distance to gamma and is hyperbolic. So actually, it holds even if you assume that you have some very uh, infinite support, but a very big tail, a very steep uh, decay at infinity. And this was extended by Guezel. So, Guezel, uh, uh, super exponential moment. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, but uh, I won't get into that. So what I would like to do is to present a proof uh, following actually Bezel's argument, which is the one I was able to understand. But in the thing of finitely supported works. Okay, so first I will start with a lemma, which says that if there exists some lambda positive such that the expectation of exponential of lambda of the distance from my point W to X of W 
is finite, then uh, gamma endowed with any word metric is quasi isometric. To the, uh, to the green metric. So here I have the only assumption is uh, gamma finitely generated, support of mu symmetric and generates a group. Symmetric. Okay, I don't need hyperbolicity or stuff like that. And of course, transience of the work. This one? This, so I, I say that if I have an exponential moment, meaning that the exponential of the distance, so this means that I have very small, I can have some jumps very big, but this is very rare because I, the exponential of that has to be finite in, uh, in average. Uh, I don't, it will follow from that. But, uh, but there is a very general lemma which relates the geometry of the group with the geometry of the group with the uh, green metric. As soon as you have this sort of control. Yes, I would like to, to explain this. Start with. Okay. And so when there is a, uh, it's easy to let S be a finite generating set. Okay. And then you look at the distance, so maybe I will call it DS of XY is uh, the word distance. So I need to prove two inequalities. So one is always true and requires almost nothing when you want to compare a metric, an invariant metric to the to a word metric. So if I let capital L to be the max of the green distances from the neutral element to S when S is in capital S. So now what will happen is that, so because both metrics are invariant, I just need to compute the distances to the origin, to the neutral element. Okay, so now at x, I write it as s1, sk. So then the distance in the green metric from e to x is bounded by the sum of a j of the green, so I apply the triangle inequality from Sj to Sj plus 1, where S0 will be the neutral, uh, will be 0. No, so it's not that, it's uh, S1 up to Sj, S1 up to Sj plus 1. Okay, so I just I have my, my geodesic here in the word metric, and I cut the thing, and I just said that I'm going pass by that. And so because it is a, an action by isometries, this is the same as the sum of dg of, from the distance from the neutral element to sj plus 1, if you want. And so here, this thing is bounded by capital L. And how many do I have? I have exactly the distance from E to X. Okay. So th th this requires nothing. It's always true. So what's harder is to prove the, the other way around. 
or harder, I mean Montreal or whatever. Okay. So what I want to prove actually is that the Green's function will decay exponentially fast. This is the thing. So getting the lower bound, proving that uh, 1 over L min, uh, distance in S of XY bounded uh, minus some C bounded by uh, DG of X to Y is the same as proving that the green function decays exponentially fast. Okay, by definition of the green function, of the green metric. So that's what I want to do. So for this, I have to use the fact that I have this uh, condition here. Okay, so I will denote by capital E this number, which would be very useful. So let me just give you a simple estimate of how we can control the fact that we don't jump very often very far when you do the random walk. So I fix n, and I consider the probability that the soup of the distance so the soup between for k between 1 and little n of the distance in my word distance of w of a neutral element to zk is larger than uh, uh, so what do I want to say? Okay, so okay, I don't know what's going on here. I mixed up everything of my notes, all my notes. So what is it I want to prove? Ah, yes. Bigger than n times b, where b is a fixed constant. So I want to, to show that this is small, if, if b is chosen well. Okay? So the usual trick to estimate this kind of thing is to use uh, Chebyshev inequality or Markov inequality or bien I don't know how you call it, but... Uh, but it's the same. So here I want to use the exponential version of it. So meaning that if this distance is at least b, then lambda times this is at least lambda times that. And exponential of lambda of this is whatever. So then this is smaller than what? This is smaller than exponential minus lambda and b. And then I have the expectation of E lambda times the soup of ds of ezk. So this is just this uh, standard inequality. And now I want to control this soup here. So the idea, which is uh, very simple, is I take any one of those, and again, use the triangle inequality as I did before. So I say that this is smaller than the sum for j between uh, 1 and k of the distance from zj minus 1 to zj. And then, since I want to control all of it, I can, instead of summing up to k, I can sum up to n. I know it was, use, it was useless to change the letters since I write them in the same way, but still. Okay, so now I know that I will control the super. And so what is interesting here, of course, is that I still have my action by isometries. So this is bounded by the sum of j of 1 of n to n of the distance from E 
to Xj. Well, Xj was my uh, the projections uh, of my uh, the increments. Okay. And so what is interesting now is that when I put plug it in my exponential, the sum becomes a product, and uh, all these events are independent. So I get a power. What I get is this thing here will be bounded above by e minus lambda n b times e to the power n. Okay. And so if b is small enough, then uh, this will decay exponentially fast. So for b. Take b such that uh, log of e minus lambda b is uh, negative, and then uh, I'm happy. Okay. Uh, here, maybe I need uh, non anonymity. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not. Mm -hmm. If I have finite support, yes. But see, here, what I'd like is to get the largest case where I can apply it. You see, th there's a thing saying that things should be quasi isometric invariant, like, for instance, Gromov hyperbolicity. And so, if I can prove that two metrics are quasi, uh, quasi isometric and one is hyperbolic, then I expect the other one to be hyperbolic because that's what I was told all my life studying when I, <laughs> okay, because I was born in 87. <laughs> so that's why I, I, I take this, this effort to, to, to work with uh, this larger setting. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I want to compute the green function between two points, maybe I call it x, whatever. So this is the sum over n of mu n of x. So I want to cut it into two parts. So the first part will be I sum for n smaller than g over b. And then I sum above. Hmm? Uh, it's x, I'm sorry. Because in my notes it's gamma. So. <laughs> so these are all ends. Okay? It said when I write uh, g for x or x for g. Okay, so here you see I will have a good control because uh, of that. And here I will have a good control if I use uh, non amenability. So then it means that I have to add non amenability. Instead of transients here, I need to say non amenable. I'm sorry. So, so this is bounded by, so I call this constant C, since I already have B. So this is bounded by uh, X over B times exponential minus uh, C of x, is that correct? And then here I have exponential of minus n x over b, okay, where n was my constant of, uh, was given by the amenability constant. Hmm? Am I saying something stupid? Ah, uh, the constants might not be correct. Minus C. Ah, uh, divided by B, you mean? 
Yeah, okay. So there are concerns in front. Well, you, 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 you can figure it out, I guess. But at least you see I have my exponential decay there. So, so as I said, uh, what did I say? So if now my group is hyperbolic, I know that my green metric is quasi-isometric to a hyperbolic metric. And so I would like to conclude that it is hyperbolic too. And the thing is that uh, it's not true in general. Uh, and actually, even in this context of random walks, Guezel has constructed examples of measures Uh, there exist measures on any word hyperbolic, non elementary word hyperbolic group gamma with exponential moment such that the green metric is not hyperbolic. Oh. Mean that uh, we need something stronger than that. And it's not true that just being quasi isometric to a hyperbolic distance, you are yourself quasi uh, hyperbolic. So, this is a subtlety that usually we don't see because, uh, because we always work on uh, geodesic spaces. And so, it's not enough to be a quasi geodesic space and being quasi-isometric to, uh, uh, to a hyperbolic distance to be that, okay? <laughs> and actually, there's uh, one thing you can do is you take any distance, you, you pick your favorite uh, word distance and you cook up a new distance d from x to y to be your initial distance from x to y plus log of 1 plus dx of y ds of x of y. So you can check that you have an action by isometries on this metric, which is quasi-isometric to your um, word distance, but it is never hyperbolic. Okay? So then we will wonder what is the problem. Okay? Why is it true? So it turns out that there is a property of quasi geodesics in word hyperbolic, in uh, geodesic metric spaces and hyperbolic spaces that usually we never state, which is, highly, which is actually very important there and which makes the whole difference. Okay, so let X be uh, any hyperbolic space, geodesic hyperbolic space. Uh, let me just uh, come up. The fact that it is geodesic is not important because there's a construction by Bonk and Schramm which shows that each time you have a hyperbolic space, you can embed it isometrically into a geodesic hyperbolic space with the same constant, delta. Okay? So this is really a property of hyperbolicity. But since I want to use geodesics just to show you uh, what I want to say, so what is a quasi-geodesic? A quasi-geodesic is something like that, right? It is essentially a bi Lipschitz image of a geodesic. So it wiggles around. So now there's a very important property which is called Morse lemma, which says that a quasi-geodesic always shadows a genuine geodesic, right? This is a geodesic. And so, the thing is that each time you pick three points in your quasi-geodesic, you call them uh, X, Y, Z, 
because you have bounded distance on genuine geodesic, what you can check is that you almost have uh, the, the points are almost in a line, meaning that, for instance, so they are, uh, if you look at the at the Gromov product from x z seen from y, this is always bounded by a constant tau. And so this is exactly what you need to get hyperbolicity. So this, I call this uh, such a quasi geodesic which satisfies this property for any point in this order. We defined it to be a quasi ruled space. Quasi ruled space. It is a quasi geodesic space. Geodesic space. Such that for any lambda C quasi geodesic. Uh, Q for any X, Y, Z in that order. The Gromov product of X, Z seen from Y is bounded by some tau, which only depends on lambda C and, uh, and uh, lambda C. Okay. And so then the theorem, which I will prove, is to say that... Uh, if X is quasi ruled and quasi isometric to a hyperbolic space, then X is hyperbolic. Because it will satisfy Morse lemma, essentially. That's what it says. And so you can check here that this metric is not quasi ruled, even on Z. You don't need to take any weird thing. You just need to, to check it on a geodesic. So just pick Z. So this is what is missing in all this uh, construction that we did. And so The theorem, the real theorem of Ancona is saying that we have this quasi-ruled uh, assumption when it's finitely supported. Ah, I should have not have erased the assumptions. Okay, so. Gamma hyperbolic, mu finitely supported. Uh, then there exists a constant C such that it is necessarily insufficient. Yeah, so here maybe if, uh, it is uh, Blacher, uh, Pierre Mathieu, and I who did that. The thing is, we didn't really invent the thing, we just took uh, our favorite textbook on Gromov hyperbolicity and we checked that it was working. Huh? There's nothing... Uh, uh, the C such that for any x, y in gamma, or any z in the segment x, y, the probability to get from x to y is not so far as the probability to go from x to y going through the point z. So this is really it is necessary, the, the hard thing to prove. So this is what I would like to do now. Okay. I'm doing, uh, yeah.
So I would first like to start with a couple of uh, lemmas, which should explain where it will come from. So the first lemma says that if the two points are not very far away, then we always get a bound, which might not be very good, but uh, yeah, this is exactly the, that one. Okay, so uh, there exists a constant for any d positive. There exists a constant c such that if the distance from x to y is bounded by d, then f x y bounded by c of x z z y. So this is some sort of arnaque inequality, if you want. So the idea is uh, pretty simple. So this means that I only care about what's going on at big scales, because here I always have some bounds, but which depends on d, of course. But uh, uh, yeah. So how do you do that? So first you fix. Yes, 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 yes. So you fix k such that the support of mu k contains your generating set S. Okay. And so now the thing is so you have X and Y and have Z in the middle. So you want to see, you want to compute the probability to go from x to y. So you know that you have a path, a geodesic path going from one to the other, and uh, that you can attain it in uh, k times the distance, right? So then this means that the probability to go from x to y is at least uh, so the soup of mu k to the power x minus x. No, that's not. No, it's not what I want to say. I guess. <laughs> What I want to say is that, uh, so I look at all the paths. So this is always bounded by, uh, yes, no, this I don't care, actually. I, I want to do it with z. So it's the same. Huh? It's equal to the, to the infimum, sorry, the minimum of mu k, which is non zero, I mean, uh, on the support, to the power x minus z. Because I have a, I know that in k steps I have a chance of getting at distance one, and then I, I do the same uh, little by little. And so this product, f of x z times f of z y, will be at least some number c uh, lambda to the power d. V2D, if you want. If you want to call lambda this number. And so this is bigger than lambda 2D times f of x of y, because this is smaller than 1 in any case. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, this is a nonsense, but, uh, but just I have to do it. And so now the point to get something uniform. is the following fact in uh, hyperbolic geometry. So pick a ball of radius R, centered at some point uh, Z, and pick two points which are outside of that ball, X and Y. 
And I want to see what happened, what is the length of a curve which avoids the, bo uh, the ball here. And what, I, what hyper hyperbolicity tells you is that this is exponential in the radius. So if R is the radius of this ball, so for any R, for any N, so I assume that X and Y do not belong to the ball of radius N. I assume that the Gromov product meet seen from Z is not too big, because of course if the points are very close, they can be outside the ball, I won't get any, any bound. But having an upper bound on the Gromov product tells me something. Then the length of any curve disjoint uh, joining x, y disjoint from the ball centered at z and r is at least exponential alpha times r, where alpha is, uh, only depends on where alpha depends on the hyperbolic constant and capital N. So this is uh, what is called the uh, hyperbolic divergence of uh, exponential divergence of geodesics. And so now if I want to compute the probability to go from x to y avoiding a point z, then this will be huge. Okay? So the, core, so the, the prop proposition that I want to say is that if I'm in the same setting, so, uh, so x, y are not in the ball of radius r centered at z. The support of me is finite. And, uh, and what? And I will assume that the distance from x to to y is bounded by some constant times r. So they are not too far away because otherwise I, I wouldn't control anything. Then the probability of any path disjoint from this ball, going from uh, x to y in finite time, knowing that uh, conditioned by this property is, exponential, uh, is a super expo uh, is super exponentially small, is e to the minus uh, alpha prime of e to the alpha r. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's always the same again. So when it's finitely supported, it's much easier because you know that essentially so you, you need to compute the green function between you want to look at a path which avoids this thing. So how many steps do you need? So any simple path going from x to y outside, outside of uh, bzr, 
we know that it has an exponential length in R. Okay? So this means that we need something like E to the alpha R, and maybe you divide by the diameter of your... Uh, of the support of new steps. Okay. Essentially. So you, you try to go the fastest possible to go from one point to the other, so you make the, be the hugest step that you can in that direction, but in any case, since you need uh, an, an exponential number of uh, things here, it will remain exponential. Right. And now you see, because uh, so this means that when you compute the Gun um, the Gun function restricted to this set of paths, you start at rank because so so when you look at the Gun function. So this is the sum of uh, mu n of x minus n of, of y. You know that you have no chance of getting there for small n's. Because you need, here, you, you need uh, at least exponentially many, many steps. So your sum here, which contributes to all the paths which avoids, so maybe I should write it differently. Uh, so the probability to go from x to y in finite time uh, so that Zn does not belong to the ball of radius r for all n in between uh, in between you know that you cannot attain it for n smaller than this number here Mm -hmm. So it is, at most, e to the minus n, at best, uh, yeah, at most, at best, exponential of alpha r divided by my diameter of the soup. Okay. Okay. Because this means that this is bounded by the sum over n, at least this number, exponential of alpha. Uh, exponential of alpha r divided by the sup of mu of mu of x minus 1y. Okay, so you look at each step, when can you get to, to z, and you know that the first possible step is that one. And you know that this thing is bounded by e to the minus mn. And so from this, you get that. Okay. And so the idea is to use these two estimates to get to Ancona's inequality. Uh, so of course, I'm back out of time. <laughs> what I wanted to say, but that's fine. So now let me try to explain the proof of uh, Guesel. Proof of Ancona. After Guesel. So I take a number d which will be very big, but not that big compared to the distance from x to okay. And I have my point x and my point y here. Okay. And I have my point z somewhere in between. And so first I say that well, if the distance from x to y is smaller than d, then I have a uniform bound. So now what I want is to get closer and show that I will get closer, not getting too far from the geodesic at each step. 
And so I proceed as follows. So I fix a number theta, which will be smaller than one half, and some number lambda, which will depend on, uh, on positive, and lambda, which will depend on, on theta, which will be also smaller than one. So I want to build a sequence of bars so that either I, over, I avoid them, but this will be very, with very easy, small probability, or I get through the ball, and then I'm happy because it reduces my induction somehow. So I look at which point is the further away from, from Z. So here it is Y. So then I look at the point Y1 here, which is at distance theta times uh, x minus y. Okay. And then I consider the ball of radius lambda times x minus y. And what I want is that lambda is smaller than theta so that uh, at least it is disjoint. And all my balls, I want them to be disjoint. Okay. And then I... So you see that if you avoid this ball, then this is with super exponential uh, small uh, probability. So, uh, so it is much probable that you will get into this ball. And then I can reiterate, because I lost almost no mass. And so I compare the distances from these two. I look which one is the farthest away. It's again y1 uh, on the y side. So then. I multiply by theta, so this is theta times x minus y1, and I look at the ball lambda times x minus y1. Okay, so what I want is that the ratio of the distance compared to the radius is always bounded. So that I'm exactly in the setting of this, uh, of this proposition. Okay, and now, the thing is that it is this ball now, which is uh, this point which is further away. So now I, I will define x3 to be at distance theta. So this will be at distance theta times x minus y, uh, no, it's x2 then, y1. Okay, and I look at the ball of radius lambda times the distance from x minus y1. And I proceed as follows until the distance between the two is bounded by d. And so now what I claim is that if you look at all the paths which go from x to y, either, so maybe I take a new color now, uh, but I've already used, uh, ah, I can use yellow. So either I get through all the balls in the in that order. So it doesn't mean that I cannot come back. So here I can do something like this. Uh, here I don't know what's going on. Uh, so here, yes, here I have my last balls there, I guess. Okay, I don't know how it goes, but I know that I have a sequence of times where I go through the balls in a linear order. And so then, Using the Markov property, so I would like to have a, a last. I thought there was some red at some point. Right? Yeah. I can decompose the work saying so that I look at the first time I get to this ball, then the first time I get from this ball to that one, and then the, I go back here. And so what I can say is that I get somewhere, 
the first time I get here and the first time I get there at some points. And then I truncate what I say is that the probability to go from here to there is bounded. I have, it's almost the same as if I went through, through Z because they are distance smaller than D. And then it means that the probability to go from X to Y going through all the balls is the same as the probability to go from here to Z and then from here to Z, from Z to Y, and I have a uniform bound there. So this is the probability of going through all balls. is bounded from the probability to go from x to z, from z to y. Because as each step, I can use the Markov property to, to use the fact that they are independent. The, the path, the first time I get to this ball will be independent from the first time I get from that point to the first time I get to that ball, which is independent from the point I arrived here to get to, to y. And so then when I want to deal with this, I just apply my little lemma here, saying that when I'm distance smaller than D, then I'm fine. Okay, so now, how does the other um, trajectories look like? It means that at some stage, I go to a ball, and then I went to the next one before going through this one, or even avoiding it totally, I don't know. But the way I constructed my balls was to say that this radius was comparable to the, that distance. And the Bromov product here is well controlled because I'm in hyperbolic geometry. And so this is super exponentially small. And so what is the contribution of the super exponential small uh, thing? It only depends on little d, actually, because all these numbers decay essentially geometrically, and the smallest one is d. So if I pick d large enough, so, or D large enough, the probability of avoiding one ball will be at most one half. And even knowing that you're going from X to Y. And so this is enough to conclude. Because this means that the probability of avoiding one of these balls is smaller than one half the probability from going from X to Y. Okay, and, and I guess that's good enough to get. Uh, my lower bound, because here I have this thing. So th this uh, finishes the proof. So cannot be, I could try to be more precise than that, but then I would write many formulas, and I don't think it would be any helpful. So the idea is really this story of pregnant balls of big size, and so that either you avoid them, but then the probability is so small that it never happens, or you go through them and then you get back to the situation where you are close enough. Okay. Oh, and it's time. So uh, maybe I, I would like... Uh, I would like to give some... Uh, uh, I, will, I guess it's better to stop. And uh, I'll see what I do tomorrow then. Uh, so, I won't have time to do I still have two minutes. <laughs> so I won't have time to do exactly what I wanted. Uh, 
but I'll try to give enough evidence. I think uh, so. Uh, let me just try to tell you what I would like to do tomorrow, at least the program. What I had in mind first. So from that, I want to get some uh, uh, properties on the random walk on my initial group acting on the space. Because now I know that the green metric is hyperbolic, that the harmonic measure is uh, conformal with respect to the green metric. So this I want to get some estimates on the harmonic measure, but for the word metric and see what's going on. And uh, so uh, the, the main result tomorrow will be to prove that the dimension of the harmonic measure with the visual distance, so uh, I don't want to put a thing. What I want to say is that um, what I want is applied The properties uh, apply the, the fact that did the, my group with the green metric is hyperbolic to deduce geometric properties. I don't know why I write it down, but it's okay. Uh, of my group gamma acting on my space X geometrically. Okay. And trying to understand how is the harmonic measure on the boundary of X, which was my starting point, my group acting on X with a random walk, and then I'm looking in the setting of Kamenovich. Okay. And so there are many consequences which will fall at once from this, just knowing that I have a quasi isometry between the two spaces. And that I have the hyperbolic property, so I have some new properties on the, on the harmonic measure, knowing that it is a conformal measure. And so that's what I will try to do tomorrow. And, uh, okay, I stop. <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, it's in his, uh, he has a paper uh, at uh, the Annals of uh, uh, So actually I'm preparing a list of references uh, But it's a little longer than I thought to prepare <laughs> So he has a paper named, named uh, Martin Boundary and something like that So it's either, anal I think it's Annals of Probability and so he works with uh, super exponential tails. So it's much harder because here you see my, this estimate there saying that it was decaying super exponentially fast was kind of uh, obvious because I had only finitely, the jumps were controlled all the time. So when you have an infinite tail, then you have to, to control it. And the fact somehow that you need something super exponential is because you want this uh, conditioned uh, probability to be very small. And then, so you need a difference of uh, speed of growth. And since you cannot compare constants, because we don't know how to do that, we have to compare just the, so for instance, we, can, we make a difference between logarithms and polynomials, polynomials and exponentials. And here I needed to make a difference between super exponential and exponential. And so I think that's why you cannot do better really than super exponential tails in some sense. Hmm? The notes you were following, lecture note or something? Yeah, so I tried to prepare some lecture notes. So I typed many things, but I realized that, so I made some paste, I took the archive papers of many people, and then I tried to, to glue them together and then rearrange the proofs because so that I could understand them, keep the same notation, but I, it was too long to... Yeah, it's half in French, half in English, <laughs> and half wrong also. <laughs> but if you think it's helpful, <laughs> I can, but... <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid it's, it's still very far from being uh, readable. 
for someone who didn't type it. Yes. What do you mean? Ah, I don't know. Uh, well, it means that your quasi geodesics are almost straight. <laughs> so sometimes you're far from a flat. I don't know. It's. Uh, I think it's, you really have to see that like a Morse lemma, somehow, a, a way of expressing the Morse lemma. It's a version of convexity. Of quasi complexity, I should say. Uh, like, yeah. Hmm? Because uh, for us it was convenient to state it. Like <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Then you know when you read a paper, you see definitions. And then say, oh, no, that's not the right definition. I need it for something else. But in, the, in that paper, maybe it was the right way to define the notion. Before the notion gets fixed, how many definitions did you go through to, um, to pick it up? Uh, this is uh, the first uh, version, if you want. A beta version. <laughs> so if you have a better definition, then uh, I'm glad. Uh, here, the only thing uh, we wanted to do is to be able to do all the theory of geodesic hyperbolic spaces without geodesics. And so it turned out that the, right, the thing that which really worked out, even the approximation by trees, works in this setting. So if you have a hyperbolic quasi world space, you have approximation by trees exactly as I stated, where you replace the rays by quasi, -ray, quasi world rays. So this is why did we say rule? Because uh, in French, uh, well, it's a ruler, you know, so it's, uh, it's straight. It's this idea that uh, you keep the, the, the points aligned. Exactly. So you see, for instance, in the book of Gilles Delarbe, the first example they gave of a um, quasi-isometric space, a uh, quasi-isometric space to a hyperbolic space which is not hyperbolic, a counter example of the invariance by quasi isometries is uh, it is uh, the thing like this. So you keep the 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 the, the angle here fixed and you may go far, further and further away, and so there you see that your, your triangles are not thin, right? But the idea is also that if you look at uh, the best line which can approximate this kind of curve, well, uh, the triangle inequality becomes worse and worse also. It's another way of saying, saying the same thing. Maybe it's as if you were taking a point at infinity, uh, uh, you were looking at some sort of huge degenerate triangle or bygones. It's, it's, it's maybe a way of expressing that is to say that your bygones are not thin. Somehow. I don't know exactly how to, I didn't really think of it more precisely than that, but, um, but for me it's really like more, uh, translation of Morsema.